about uh, the role that algebraity and generalization of algebraic play in uh, algebraic theory in the frame of Thank you, Anne. Uh, so thank you for the introduction, for the invitation. Uh, this is the last week, so perhaps we should thank the organizers for a wonderful week where we've learned a lot. Uh, could I ask you in the back to open the window? Uh, it's getting a bit stiff here. I mean, you can doze off, but I shouldn't, so uh, this is probably better. Okay, thank you. So in this talk, I'll be mostly interested in the question of which optimization problems can be solved exactly using linear programming. And this will have some computational complexity consequences. And it doesn't have anything to do with rigidity, as far as I know. But uh, on the way, we'll see some generalizations of submodularity. <coughs> so the types of problems I'll be interested in are problems with explicit objective functions. Classic example, a tractable one is the SD min cut problem, given a graph, two special vertices. We want to separate them by a cut of smallest size. And the notation in this talk will be as follows. So here I define a binary function. Binary meaning it takes two arguments. Each variable is Boolean meaning take 0 or 1, being in or outside of the cut. And the function just counts whether an edge belongs to the cut or not. So this edge sits on every edge in the graph. And then I define two constant functions, uh, unary functions, which fix constants. So uh, gamma sub 0 makes sure that the argument is 0, otherwise it is infinity. And then the question of what is the size of the smallest st cut in this graph is equivalent to asking what is this quantity I want to minimize where I make sure S gets assigned 0, T gets assigned 1, and in the sum I just count the number of edges going across. So this is a classic problem that we can solve in polynomial time using, for instance, linear programming. Another example that we don't know how to solve exactly because it's NP-complete is the vertex cover problem. And here, again, the function is again binary defined on 0, 1. This function psi makes sure that from, for, um, for an edge, at least one of its two endpoints is selected. So this sits on all edges of the graph. And then I have a unary con, uh, con identity function that uh, counts the number of vertices being selected. And again, asking what is the size of the smallest vertex cover is equivalent to minimizing this, this objective function. So in general, these kind of problems are called CSPs or valued CSPs, valued constraint satisfaction problems. And the notation used is by Q bar. I'll mean the set of all rationals together with positive infinity. And the general framework is as you might expect. Uh, you are given n variables, x1 through xn and a finite set D, which is the domain. In the previous examples, it was 0, 1. And the objective function is given explicitly as a sum of, say, Q terms. Each term is a function uh, of fixed arity. So in the previous example, it was either 1 or 2. And uh, the goal is to find an assignment of values from the domain to the variables that minimizes this quantity. So in the vertex example, the D was 0, 1. The set of variables was the set of vertices of the graph, and this was the objective function. Now, the question we are interested in is the following. Which class of VCSP instances are tractable? And he, in order to, well, we need to be slightly more precise, we need to decide on what classes of VCSP we care about, because, of course, in general, this is NP-complete. And secondly, what do we mean by tractable? So there's a lot of body of literature on, you know, I'll focus on exact solvability, but, of course, you can ask, and people have asked a lot, um, questions about approximability, robust approximability, fixed parameter tractable, and so on and so forth. And for the class, of, which class of VCSPs I'll be interested in, I'll focus on the perhaps the most uh, natural restriction and the one that's been studied the most. That's when I restrict the types of functions you can have in the objective function. So these are often called the language restricted VCSPs because the standard terminology in this community is to call a set of functions on some fixed finite domain D, a language, constraint language. And then VCSP of gamma is the set of all VCSP instances, that is to say, all optimization problems of this form in which all functions, so those are the phi ones through phi q, coming from gamma. And the question is, which languages are tractable and which are not? For which set of functions, the class of problems built from these functions can be solved exactly in polynomial time? So in the first example we saw, uh, seven minutes ago, in the ST-Minicat example, here's an example of a language. D is 0, 1, it's a fixed domain, and gamma consists of, uh, capital gamma consists of uh, gamma 0, gamma 1, and phi. And that language allowed us to express the ST-Minicat problem, but it's easy to see that it's the other way as well. In fact, any instance built over this language can be solved using ST-Minicat problem because these functions don't allow you to do anything else. Okay, 
the vertex cover. Again, this is an example of an intractable language. So this is a very general framework. Uh, so there are very special cases that have been studied before. For instance, perhaps the, uh, the most well-known one, if all the functions are zero infinity valued, in fact, there is no optimization involved. These are just relations. So it seems rather strange trying to minimize it, but it's, it's just a decision problem. And these are constraint satisfaction problems. The language restricted ones are known as non-uniform. And there's a famous conjecture on Fede and Varde from uh, more than 20 years ago that uh, these problems admit a dichotomy. All the problems are either solvable exactly in polymer time or be complete. Uh, and there are some other special cases that we'll uh, touch on later on. So how do you solve these structures, the cases that can be solved in uh, polynomial time? Well, there are very specialized algorithms, but in this talk I want to focus on what can be solved using linear programming. So the idea is, as probably most people here know, you take your problem, in this case a VCSP instance, you formulate it as an LP problem, an integer problem. Well, it doesn't help you, you relax the condition. Maybe the LP is not exact, so you try to make it more tighter, ideally exact, by throwing in more and more inequalities. So that's what we will do. And the idea of Charlie Adams, say the kth level, ignore that there are two parameters for now, the, shell, the kth level of the Charlie Adams hierarchy is that you throw in all possible inequalities involving at most k variables. That's a high level idea. I want to define this hierarchy using two parameters because that gives you a slightly uh, uh, better view of what's going on, slightly stronger result. But uh, if you know Charlie Adams, as probably most of you do, think of k being equal to L. So this is my instance. This is a VCSP instance, a discrete optimization problem. Um, the second parameter, L, uh, is the one that, so the condition is that every set of at most L variables appears precisely as the scope of one of the terms in the objective function. Think of KNL being fixed. Otherwise, this uh, linear program wouldn't be of polynomial size. So this is the L. And then, the, so x1 through xn are the variables of the VCSP instance. And the variables of the linear program are those lambda sub i sigma. So for every i, for every term in the objective function, and for every assignment of values to the variables in the scope of the i term. So there's, this, there's a lot of x's here. x1 through xn are the variables of the original problem. Bold x sub i is a list of variables. That's the scope of the i function. And the capital XI is the set of the variables in the scope because uh, there could be some repetition. Of course, you could assume that there is not, but the, why, why not to make it uh, this general? So capital uh, X sub I is the set of variables in bold XI. So these are the variables of the linear program. And now what is the linear program itself? Well, we want these to be uh, probability distributions, these variables. So they should be non-negative. They should sum up to one. That's the third condition over all possible assignments for, say, for fixed I which is the ith term in the objective function. For all possible assignments of variables in the scope of the ith term, uh, they should sum up to 1. And the, the middle condition says that the infeasible assignments that gets infinity are forbidden. So they get probability 0. So the most interesting part of the linear program is, is the last bit, and that's the usual marginalization constraint. So it says that if you have two scopes and one of them is a subset of the other, they have to agree. But this is only required if the smaller of the two is of size at most k. So this is the second parameter of the, of the, or the first parameter, if you like, of the shell Adams hierarchy. And if k, k and L are fixed, this is a LP of a polynomial size, and it can be solved. Now, if k equals L equals 1, this is the well-known basic linear programming organization, in which case you require, if, if I gave you an objective function, I mean the, a VCSP instance, you are saying that you have variables in the linear program only for the assignments to the terms in the objective function and variable value assignments. <coughs> so because it's a relaxation, the value of the linear program is a lower bound on the value of the uh, VCSP instance you want to solve. And we say that SAKLA, for some fixed KNL, works if the two optimum co coincide. Which means that by solving the linear program, you solve the original problem. And uh, in the rest of the talk, I'm going to tell you about results of the form, when does this happen? For which languages is it the case that SA with some KNL actually works? In order to do that, I'll tell you a bit about polymorphisms. So polymorphisms are, are the key concept in this algebraic 
approach to constraint satisfaction problems and valued constraint satisfaction problems. It's actually a simple idea. Polymorphisms are operations that uh, preserve solutions, feasible solutions. So if I give you, say, if I want a ternary polymorphism, I give you three uh, feasible solutions, and the polymorphism acts component-wise on these feasible solutions, and it has to return a feasible solution. So here's the general definition, but the example I have here, here's a ternary function, 0, 1, and all but one assignments are feasible. Only one of them is infeasible, that's the infinity one, infinite value. Now, if I take any two, uh, any two uh, assignments, feasible solutions, I've taken the ones in red, and I apply min operation component-wise, when min does what you would expect, take small of the two arguments, I get another feasible solution. And it's not true only for these two assignments, x1 and x2. It's actually true for if you take any, any pair from the seven available. So in this case, we say that the binary min operation is a polymorphism of, of this weighted relation. <coughs> if you haven't seen the, this concept before, this is the reason why, uh, for instance, horns are destructible. The underlying algebraic reason why horns are dissolvable in polynomial time is that the set of solutions admits this min operation as a polymorphism. Now, these are polymorphisms. Uh, they've been studied in universal algebra. They are very useful. Um, the key idea there is that if you don't have any non-trivial polymorphism, you get NP hardness for free. Because then the, the, um, the function phi can behave as it wants, and it can encode uh, NP complete problems, or APX hard problems, if you care about approximability versus inapproximability. If you have an, uh, some polymorphism, like in this case min, you can use it to deduce some structure and uh, design a polynomial time algorithm. Now, polymorphisms are useful for decision problems. If you want to um, study optimization problems, you need a generalization, things called weighted polymorphisms. And I'll define them in two slides, but in the next slide, I'll finally uh, uh, show you something about submodularity. So this is not the first one, def not the first definition of submodularity this week, but I'm sure it's the last one. Uh, here's an equivalent one using just 0, 1 vectors. But I want you to focus, so this is minimal component-wise, you've seen this. I want you to focus on the last inequality. What if I have a function phi that is not submodular but seems kind of close? So for any x and y, the following inequality holds. So the right-hand side stays the same as in, in the submodular inequality, which is just above. And on the left-hand side, I left the first term, and the second term, I just have a coefficient there, two-thirds, and there's a, one extra term. What if I have a function phi that satisfies these inequalities for all possible x and y's? Is it, uh, you know, what structure does it have? Can it be minimized exactly? Can it be approximated? What can I say? Well, if f was equal to max, it would be just the submodularity. What if it's something else? So it obviously depends on f. And this is the idea of a weighted polymorphism, where you think of sub submodularity as the concept where the only polymorphisms appearing is min and max. So here's the formal definition. If I have a weight uh, function, what is it called, phi, I look at the set of its polymorphisms, and then a probability distribution on this set of operations, the set of polymorphisms, is called a weighted polymorphism if linear inequalities of the following form hold. On the right-hand side, I have the average of k feasible solutions. On the left-hand side, I have the expected value of a feasible solution I get if I apply the probability distribution. So if you think of min and max, the submodularity concept, that's precisely the probability distribution that assigns half to min and half to max. And it's known that these objects, weighted polymorphisms, actually capture the computational complexity, at least when it comes to exact solvability of value TSPs. In fact, they are interesting objects. So they generalize clones. So uh, there are now people who study these things, one of my students and other people, just for the sake of uh, uh, interesting objects uh, with no relation to computer science applications. But they have some applications in computer science. Um, and here's one. One last piece of notation. If I have a language gamma, so that's a set of functions, and I look at the set of its weighted polymorphisms, then those that appear with, non, uh, with positive probability in some weighted polymorphism of this gamma I call them the support. For instance, if gamma is the set of submodular functions, this set would certainly include min and max, and some more. And the first result, so sorry, I should say that this, this object, this support, is a clone. What do I mean by that? It's a set of operations that is closed under composition and contains all projections. So it has some nice algebraic structure. And the first result I want to mention here from a few years ago, then together with the Yuan Tapa, is the following. 
gamma can be solved by BLP, which means any, v, any optimization problem where the objective function consists of functions coming from gamma can be solved exactly using the BLP, if and only if the following condition holds. So for every k at least 2, there's a k array operation in the support of gamma that is symmetric, by which I mean the order of the arguments doesn't matter. So is this of any use? Well, this condition is an algebraic condition can be used. It gives you an idea of what's going on. It's fair to say that we don't even know whether this is a decidable condition. But it can, be, it, it can be surprisingly powerful. And here's an example. We all know that if I give you a binary min, you can build a k-ray min fairly easily, like this way. And in general, you can do it for these called so-called semi-lattice operations. Semi-lattice is a binary operation that is idempotent, commutative, and dissociative. And if I give you a binary semi-lattice operation, you can build a k-ray symmetric operation. And you can do this for any k. What does it mean? It means that if, I, if, if you have language gamma and its support contains a semi-lattice operation, by the previous theorem, gamma is solved by BLP. Do we have any examples of that? Well, submodular functions, for instance. So this is the definition of submodular functions think, thought of as set functions. Min is, min is a uh, semi-lattice operation, so these functions can be minimized using the BLP. The second talk in the morning mentioned this uh, concept of lattice, submodular functions. So again, the meet, both the meet and the join are similar operations. So again, you get the tractability using the BLP. There's this concept of k-submodular functions, where the underlying uh, structure is a, uh, a semi-lattice. So again, you get the, the same operation. Or tree-submodular. I'm not sure whether you've heard of tree-submodular, but there's a concept from a few years ago used by Kolmogorov, where the underlying structure is a tree, and the meet and join operations are the two midpoints on the unique path between two vertices in the tree. All these are tractable, just using the fact that the, the, func the operation and the definition are similar to these operations. Okay, so the BLP solves a lot. And it's natural to ask whether it solves all, pos all problems, all VCSPs, and the answer is no. There are examples that don't admit weighted polymorphisms so that in the support there will be all symmetric operations of polarities. But, uh, if you look at an interesting subclass of VCSPs, namely so-called finite valued VCSPs, those are the ones where the functions are only allowed to take on Russian values rather than infinite values. So these are purely optimization problems. The condition for being solved by BLP is simpler, certainly decidable, and that requires that in the support of gamma, there is a binary symmetric operation. That's enough. And as it turns out, it's, not, it's a sufficient condition for tractability, but it's also necessary. You can show that, in fact, if this condition doesn't hold, then the problem is NP-complete. In fact, this result shows much more. It's independent of P versus NP. It actually shows that if you don't have binary symmetric weighted polymorphism, some logical condition happens. So even if P equals NP, the languages that do not satisfy this condition cannot be solved using the BLP. So it's uh, independent of P versus NP. Okay. So I defined Charlie Adams. I haven't said much about it until now. So the, here's a second result I want to mention, which is uh, more recent than the results I've mentioned so far. Again, this is just a recap of what the, support, what the support of a language is. And now the result, again, joint work with Johan Tapper from Paris, is the following. We ask which languages can be solved using the Charlie Adams hierarchy for some fixed level, K and L. And it turns out that you can be solved by say the kth L level for some k fixed k and L, if and only if you are solved by the second third level, so there's sort of a collapse, there's no need. This, this doesn't happen very often, say, in approximation, right? You often see either I can approximate well by the second level or there are results of the form. Even if you go to super constant level of some hierarchy, uh, you, uh, you don't get any good, any good approximation. Here you get a collapse. Um, and the condition is similar to the one before. This one, it says that for every k, at least three, in the support of gamma, you need to find a k operation, which this time is not symmetric, but weak near unanimity operation. So what does it mean? So near unanimity, if you forget weak, is if all the arguments but one are the same, it should return the majority of those. That appears more, more than once. And weak near unanimity means that they have to be equal. That it doesn't have to return x. If, if I wrote here equals x, it would be a near unanimity. This is a weak near unanimity. 
So this condition may seem strange if you see it for the first time, but actually it's a, it's a well-studied concept of so-called bounded width in, 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 in this area. It corresponds to precisely to what can be solved using a local consistency methods for decision problems. It also corresponds precisely to what can be robustly approximated using uh, semi-definite programming. So this is a, so the fact that these three coincide is, uh, is quite interesting. It shows how robust the notion actually is. So, the, uh, in fact, the ICAL paper just shows the sufficiency, which is the easier to show. The, uh, the other direction is, uh, is uh, almost finished. Okay. And again, it solves a lot. It's easy to show some examples. One example I want to mention is that, for instance, if the support of gamma contains the ternary majority operation, then uh, this language is solved by SA23. This was known before, and it's rather surprising. The majority corresponds to, in the decision world, to 2 sat, which is well known to be tractable. And this just shows how much you can push it further. So let me skip this. And again, we know that the uh, shell adams hierarchy solves a lot. The question is, does it solve all possible VCSPs? And again, the answer is no. There are examples that do not satisfy this. In particular, linear equations, decision problems, cannot be solved. This method that's proved, known and can be proved. And again, you can ask, is there a large and interesting class of problems for which this is a sort of universal algorithm, so it's everything that can be solved in polynomial time? And it turns out there is. This is uh, my last slide. Uh, it's the class of so-called minimum solution problems. So these are special VCSPs, or special languages, where all functions are, in fact, relations. So it seems like a decision problem. And the only optimization going on is in the unary terms. And the unary function is forced to be injective. Different values get uh, different, uh, different numbers. And in this case, you can show that either for any language, this language satisfy the condition that in the support of language there um, we can use of all RTs greater than or equal to 3, in which case SA23 solves these instances of time, or the language is NP hard. So there was some previous work on, on special cases. Um, but now we know uh, we have a complete characterization for all possible domains. And this, this may seem rather restricted. I've talked about languages that contain functions, and I, now here I'm talking about relations only plus a say, single unary injective function. But it, it turns out you cannot push this any further, because it's known that if you, if you take any language, so any set of functions that can take on rational or infinite ways, this language can be converted into a new language gamma star, which consists only of relations and a single unary function that is not injective. And the complexity doesn't change. I'm not sure about approximability, but the, with respect to exact solvability, nothing changes. I, I expect things change with respect to approximability. So, so it shows that this cannot be pushed much further. Uh, yeah, OK. I have one more slide. Uh, so what I talk about here is the power of linear program relaxations for exact solvability of ECSPs, of course, you can ask what can be solved using LPs for other class of ECSPs, widely open, not much is known. This has been studied in the context of other notions of tractability. And I guess the interesting part for this workshop might be these generalizations of submodular. But we have seen this before. Throughout the week, we have seen there was a nice talk on. Uh, skew by submodular functions and how to optimize them. So this comes from this, uh, this community. And uh, function, functions satisfying these kind of inequalities and what can be done for them in the Oracle value model, uh, it's much more difficult. It's not clear how to use LPs, of course. Uh, so you need to do more work. And it's not even clear that, say, all submodular functions, a submodular function on your favorite non-distributive lattice can be minimized in polynomial time in the Oracle value model. The same for maximization. It's a lot of open questions. Uh, but there's been uh, some good progress in recent years, a lot of papers coming from Japan uh, with good results on this. So I think I'll stop here. Thank you. I don't know. We'd have to think about it. Uh, 
me think about it a bit. Uh, So semi-definite relaxation, there's, there's a beautiful result of Raghavandra for approximability, right? It's known that uh, assuming the UGC, uh, some, uh, the basic semi-definite program relaxation get, gets you the best possible approximation ratios, but there's no characterization. I think that the dis, uh, uh, unsatisfactory sort of uh, aspect of that result. You know what the algorithm is, but there's no characterization. What are the constants and uh, how, does behave, uh, how it behaves for various languages? I mean, for exact probability? Uh, you don't need SDPs. Uh, for exact solvability, you don't need SDPs. Uh, these results show that uh, linear program relaxation, as, as you might expect, uh, uh, are enough. Oh, I think uh, the, the, the previous answer answers that you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't need them. Uh, LP is enough. For, for approximability, I, I don't know. The stronger LP memory. Oh, stronger LPs. Uh, Don't, it's, I think you don't need them. Are there results for like any LP of a certain size? Or? LPs of certain size? What do you mean by that? Like, you know, there are these lower bounds for extended right. formulation. So in this world. I do, I, no, no, I haven't seen results in this, in this form. Yeah, there are some good results for extended formulations, I agree. Yeah. Uh, haven't quite connected uh, it uh, to this to this line of work. That's a good point. More questions? <laughs>